in the very early days of the atomic age, in the middle of the war, at the time when it was rapidly being discerned that an atomic bomb would be possible, a laboratory had to be established somewhere. And a man had to be picked to direct that laboratory. The place was called Project Y. And his address was a classified address, Box 1663, Santa Fe, New Mexico, because Los Alamos was a classified word. And even the civilians and officers and military personnel who came to join this project could not reveal their location here. Their scientific journals were sent to some other box in Los Angeles. And the director of that laboratory, chosen from among the outstanding physicists of this country, was kept equally secret. It was Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, Professor of Physics at the University of California, Professor of Physics at the California Institute of Technology, and in two and a half years, between the early part of 1943 and the middle of 1945, he took an extraordinarily diverse team, extraordinarily competent team of people people of capability, people of dedication, people of objective, but people of diverse personalities. And by sheer charm, by sheer technical ability, by sheer force of personality and character, he made them into a team which tested the first nuclear device at El Magordo, and which was shortly thereafter used in the war. This man, known to all of you as the Atlas of Mitchell Salamos, is again with us tonight. He is now director of the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton, but I think to him and to us, the fellow most, and he must be inexplicably intertwined. To me, and I'm sure to all of you, it is the greatest of pleasures to welcome him again to the to speak to us tonight. Dr. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful welcome, and thank you, Dr. Bradbury, for what you said and all you didn't say. <laughs> it is, I am very glad to be back. I know there are many old friends in this hall, and I know that the things that I am to talk about are very close to all your hearts. <laughs> The story of Niels Bohr and the atomic nucleus is, in fact, rather a long and intricate one, extending from 1911 almost until his death. I want tonight to talk uh, principally about by that part of the story, which has to do with things that happened after this laboratory was founded and that had to do with the purposes for which this laboratory was founded. Can you hear me? Well, then somebody better do something about it. I will talk a little louder, but I need help from the wizards of the laboratory who are up there looking at me. Can they hear me? 
good. <laughs> uh, Bohr first encountered the atomic nucleus uh, shortly after it was discovered by Rutherford. He went to Cambridge to study, and Rutherford came there, and there was talk of what he had found. The story of that discovery is long, and I don't want to tell it at length, uh, but I will remind you of it. Uh, by the early years of this century, the hard atoms that the Greek philosophers imagined and that the chemists and physicists of the 19th century thought about had turned out not to be so very hard after all. The radioactive emanations, particularly alpha particles, just plowed through them as though they were mush, and they lost little energy, and they were very slightly deflected in their direction, but they didn't treat the atoms very respectfully. <laughs> In 1909, there was a young man, to become very eminent later, called Marsden, and Rutherford and Geiger decided that he ought to do a piece of work for which he could get a doctor, and they assigned him a typically unpromising problem. They said he should look to see if the alpha particles were ever scattered through really large angles. And a few days later, Geiger came back and said, yes, they were, and Rutherford made the following comment said it was quite the most incredible event that has ever happened to me in my life. It was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. <laughs> Rutherford did not at once understand it. It wasn't until 1911 that he said, I know what the atom looks like. He knew that it had a nucleus, that the nucleus had almost all the mass, that it had a charge which was something like half the atomic weight, what we now call the atomic number, and that the electrons had to find their way somehow outside of this structure, uh, 10,000 times bigger in its dimensions. And Bohr was enormously excited by Rutherford and by his discovery and went to Manchester. And in the first month, he was as much concerned with nuclear problems as atomic. Uh, he began to see that the separation between the two was rather sharp as far as ordinary matter and all the experience that people have had except for radioactivity, only the charge on the nucleus counted. And the nuclear affairs, such as radioactivity and all the others that have been looked in since, they depended on the details of the atomic weight as well as the atomic number. But then Bohr saw that uh, the problem of what the electrons were up to was not something that you could read in a book, because it was quite at variance with all the physics that had been developed up to, up to that time. Oh, but one thing, the discovery of quanta, light quanta, and the quantum of action. And he set to work on an enterprise which occupied him from 1912 until 1927, namely the rational description of how atoms behaved, uh, of the quantum theory of the atom, how the quantum governed the atom. Uh, then he turned, uh, having understood what this theory meant, and having understood the remarkable features that it embodied, namely that you could, by a proper experimental arrangement, uh, observe an atom and find out a great deal about it, and by another, find out quite different things, but that you couldn't combine these. He made the doctrine of complementarity and applied it to many other human activities. Uh, he had had an early philosophical interest in these things, and he applied it to such ancient and deep antinomies as that between us when we are actors and when we are spectators uh, to the Per, per, perennial conflict between love and justice in human institutions. You told me, well, I was here a few hours ago and they told me it would be dead. 
16, and uh, he and Rutherford corresponded during the war. And I will lead you through Bohr's interest in the nucleus because I think it may help to understand what he did um, during the critical times. And towards the end of the war, Rutherford wrote to tell him about his success in the first change in, an, in a nucleus, which he brought about by bombarding nitrogen without a particle. This is the familiar reaction. I will not write much on this. And uh, Rutherford detected the past protons and knew what was going on. And then the war ended. And uh, Rutherford wrote to Ball about it. And Ball wrote back, I will quote a phrase, because it seems rather melancholy in the light of what would happen a quarter of a century later and what was Ball was up to a quarter of a century later. He wrote, all of us here are convinced that there will never more be a war of such dimensions in Europe, the new era in history. When Rutherford's paper on the transmutation of nitrogen was published in 19, Bohr and Somersault both pointed out that they were probably seeing an interesting application of Einstein's relation between change of mass and release of energy. When the quantum theory finally got born in the mid-20s, and gave a rational description of the behavior of non-nuclear matter. <coughs> the interest was mostly in extending this to see how it fitted with all kinds of accumulated paradoxes and problems. But there were some applications to nuclear problems which made one hopeful that the new mechanics would work there too. And Bohr was very much interested in one in with which I was involved and which played some part in history. I had been thinking about the effects of an electric field, this was in 27, maybe 26, on an atom, a simple atom like hydrogen. And uh, it was known at that time that the spectral lines were correctly predicted. But I thought I would look and see what the stationary states were and discovered there weren't any. And this had a model. You have an electric field, uh, and uh, it is represented, if it's a uniform field, by a potential, which looks something like that. The whole is for a purpose. And uh, for an electron, this would be the positive end, and this the negative end. If you have a, a nucleus, it will be a dipole like so. If you have an electron bound in the nucleus, it will have an energy, which might as well be there. And uh, the reason there aren't any stationary states is that because of the complementarity between energy and position, there will be a very small chance, if that is as I've drawn it, and in practice, that the electron will leak out, will deflect out through this hump and fly away. Well, I didn't know anything much, but I did know that uh, Millikan and Larson had pulled electrons out of metal and made a simple formula for that which fit. But Gamow, who knew something about nuclear physics, and Gurney, who knew something about nuclear physics and was teamed up with Condon, applied this to a paradox of somewhat long standing. And that is that if you have a naturally radioactive nucleus of atomic weight A, atomic number Z, uh, it will decay uh, with, to give an alpha particle and uh, something of atomic weight A minus 4 and Z minus 2. If you bombard this object with alpha particles that have come from this object, uh, they show nothing but the electrical repulsion of the nucleus. They don't show any evidence of any nuclear structure. And Gamow and Gondor, Condon and Gern Gurney uh, showed that one had here to do with the familiar picture This is a region of high positive field. This is the nuclear matter. Here the alpha particle sits, and it gets through this barrier, according to these simple formulas that we developed. Now, 
Rock worked and gave good quantitative agreement, but its real importance was that it encouraged people in two directions. One was that <coughs> it indicated that at reasonably low energy, um, when one was dealing with particles, not alpha particles here, but protons, which are down here or here, but not able to get into the nucleus, uh, one might still have uh, nuclear reactions. And it was soon recognized that this was what the sun and the stars were all about. That story is not done today. Perhaps it'll never be done. But as far as the sun is concerned, and most of the well-behaved stars, uh, it's pretty well understood that one is dealing just with thermonuclear reactions in which the penetration of the repulsive forces about nuclei uh, play a very important part. On Earth, this had the effect of encouraging people to build accelerators. Um, most in earliest, the Croft and Walton tube at the Cavendish, uh, which wasn't a very sophisticated affair by today's standards, but it worked fine. And then later, the cyclotron and the Van de Graaff and many others. Mm -hmm. uh, so by 1932, Rutherford wrote another letter to Bohr. They corresponded in between. And uh, Rutherford first reported uh, that, uh, this was in April, uh, that, uh, that Chadwick had found the neutron. Now, the neutron was something that, Bohr, that Rutherford had predicted. He predicted it in his Bacurian lecture in 1920 for grounds that even today are compelling. Um, and he predicted further that if it could be produced, it would be very effective in producing nuclear transmutation because the neutron having no charge could go right in without any fuss. It didn't have to penetrate through any barrier. Uh, it took 12 years to find it. And then Rutherford went on to tell about the transmutation of lithium with artificially accelerated protons. This was the first successful experiment with a cutoff bolt and accelerator and the precise confirmation of the equivalence of change of mass with release of energy. Uh, that was also the year of the positron, and since positrons and electrons appear and disappear together, just using or releasing radiation, <coughs> it was a pretty complete proof that there was no trouble with that. It was with the neutrons in the mid-30s that uh, Fermi and his collaborators began his famous experiments to see what happened with slow neutrons. He found that many materials uh, were much more active. Neutrons in induced much, many more transmutations when they were slow. And if the product were radioactive, it was easy to find, and very many were. And uh, the typical reaction is that a neutron uh, gets attached to the, the target nucleus, and the energy is just lost in the form of radiation. Uh, there were some anomalies with this. Uh, the first is that the probability of the reaction corresponded to thousands, and in later examples, tens of millions of times the area of the nucleus. And that is a typical wave effect due to the fact that the neutron, too, has a wave nature and can be absorbed over areas uh, that correspond to the square of its wavelength. But the other feature that was not quite expected is that different nuclei had, at well-defined energies, at very sharp energy regions, very narrow energy regions, at which such capture took place. Well, Bohr didn't have to look this up in a book, and uh, he knew that if you have a well-defined energy and the energy spread is small, delta E, then the lifetime T, let's take out the delta, uh, this must be of the order of Planck's constant. And the fact that this was small meant that this was large, and he explained the very long time these states lasted in terms of the fact that the neutron gave up its energy to all the other particles in the nucleus. They took a long time for that energy to concentrate back or for radiation to occur. I know that many of you know that the story is somewhat more complicated, but it didn't have to be then and it doesn't have to be tonight. <coughs> well, when Fermi found that uranium got uh, 
got radioactive. Mm -hmm. uh, he naturally interpreted this in analogy with all the other experiment experiences. And indeed, it turned out that he was right 99.3% 99 of the time. But uh, fussing around with the radioactivities, it was somewhat puzzling that when you did chemistry on the activated uranium, one of the materials seemed to be radium. Now, radium is not very close to uranium. It's not heavier. And it, it wasn't at all the sort of thing that one experienced before. And uh, Hahnemann Strassemann, this was in 39, took some care with this. And they showed that the, there was something like radium there, but it wasn't radium, it was barium. And barium is a little more than half as heavy as uranium. This was a clue. And uh, Otto Frisch in Copenhagen and Miss Meitner in Stockholm seized on the clue. And they said, what is happening is that the uranium nucleus is coming apart. The fragments are not just half and half, but slightly unsymmetric, and sometimes one of them is barium. <coughs> Bohr brought this news to the United States, and uh, it caused quite a stir. And very soon, in Copenhagen, Columbia, in Berkeley, one actually saw the very energetic halves of the uranium nucleus, um, saw their energy, and identified them, and knew that fission was a reality. Bohr also worried about which isotope of uranium was producing the fission and which was behaving like all other materials and concluded that quickly that the common isotope to uranium-238 captured a neutron, lost the energy and radiation, became beta active and produced as was later found by Macmillan and the new Neptunium and then as was found by See, Borg and Wall and Kennedy <coughs> and Segre uh, formed plutonium. Bohr also worked with Wheeler on the general stability of nuclei, which would undergo spontaneous fission. This had been discovered in Russia by Flora von Petschak, which would be subject to fission by slow neutrons. And from these studies, it would have been reasonable to conclude that uranium-235, uranium-233, plutonium-239 were readily fissionable, that uranium-238 was not fissionable by slow neutrons. <coughs> well, uranium-235 is quite rare, and as you know, isn't, hard to, isn't very easy to separate, and to boil in 39, it looked almost impossible. And uh, 230, uranium-233 and plutonium don't exist in nature. So when Bohr went back to Copenhagen in 39, summer of 39, he did not expect that explosive or military applications of this discovery were very close at hand. It was indeed some time that before one knew that enough neutrons were liberated to sustain a chain reaction, it was not until 1943 and 44 that right here we knew that in fast neutron fission the number of neutrons was big enough for an explosive chain reaction and the time delays involved small enough. Well, Bohr went back to his institute in Copenhagen and to the home, which was in fact a baroque 19th century house built by the owner of the Karsberg Brewery and devoted by the Karsberg Foundation to the sustenance of culture in Denmark. <laughs> but it was a very different, a, love, a, play, a very different world. Um, for years, his institute and very movingly, the place where he and Mrs. Boy lived were a refuge, often temporary, sometimes of longer duration. In the first instance, of course, this had to do with refugees from Germany, colleagues from Germany, then from Austria. When Fermi came up to get his prize in Stockholm, he didn't go back to Italy, but stopped in Copenhagen, then came over to this country. From Russia, there were also refugees, Charlotte Hausermanns, whose husband was 
in prison in, in Russia until the Molotov-Ribbentrop Molotov -Ribbentrop Pact. I have often wondered for whom he was exchanged, and Plavchek, Weisskopf, people you know, and many others beside. And so Bohr had, in addition to his deep devotion to Denmark, which had kept him in Copenhagen 20 years earlier, when he'd been asked to come to England, pressed to come to England, he had also a sense of responsibility for his wards, for his charges, and for what he could do for the Institute. And not very much is in the public domain about those years during which Denmark was occupied. The Institute was closed in 1940. The so-called director of the dead Institute was a man who had tried to enter the living one, but Bohr was a little too canny for that. <laughs> Heisenberg and von Weizsäcker came over from Germany, and so did many others. Uh, Bohr had the impression that they came less to tell what they knew than to see if Bohr knew anything that they didn't. And I believe it was a standoff. <laughs> <coughs> then in, in 43, it became far too dangerous and it was clear that Bohr would be killed. He had been in touch with the Danish underground and through them with the British Secret Service he had a letter from Chadwick uh, encouraging him to come to England. So in the last days of September, one night he escaped in a small boat to Sweden, and three weeks later he was flown to England in the Bombay of an unarmed mosquito. They gave him an oxygen mask and a, a head gear with earphones, but the Royal Air Force wasn't used to heads like boars, and he didn't have any oxygen, and he passed out. Hmm. Of once in England and revived, uh, I agree with you that in the most of solemn things, there are always some things that aren't so. Hmm. Uh, Chadwick talked with him and told him about what, what was going on, hmm. and to bore the enterprises in this country uh, seem completely fantastic. I mean, today they, they look very old hat, but the fact that there was a great diffusion plant separating uranium isotopes in Oak Ridge, there wasn't, but it was being built, and the fact that Ernest Lawrence had, was making uranium atoms fly through a vacuum so he could pick out the light ones, and the fact that there were plutonium-making reactors building in Hanford, and the fact that there was even a place in New Mexico waiting for all this, <laughs> getting ready for all this, uh, this made an enormous impression on him. <laughs> the English were very much involved, uh, more than is generally known in this country. Uh, there, the possibility of making a bomb had been raised uh, very much as it was in this country by two refugees uh, from tyranny in Europe by Pyle and by Simon. And they had a committee which they called the Morgue Committee and a project which they called the Tubaloys Project. We never got together on the notation, but we did finally get together on the physics. And the British concluded that this was something to be explored for its possible relevance to the war, but that even if it were concluded that it would have no relevance to the war, it was too important to be left unexplored. I believe that the clarity of the British government on this had a very great effect in converting the American effort from a series of committees so secret from each other that they could make no progress into a major, very major enterprise. Well, they were concerned only with some of the methods of preparation of material, and they concluded that they were not really set up to do this, and agreed that they would work with the Canadians in this country, free of bombing and really well off for the war years. The relations with the British went up and down. They were quite good at the beginning. We had useful correspondence with Paris and Iraq on how a bomb would behave when it started exploding. But with the establishment of the Manhattan District, things were a little sticky. <laughs> 
Then, just shortly before Bohr got to England, Churchill and Roosevelt met at Quebec, and they agreed for the participation of the British and Canadians in the undertaking in this country. And they agreed that the, there would be consultation between the two countries about the political and military problems that might be involved, and they agreed about how to divide up the indispensable uranium, which in part didn't belong to either of us, <laughs> and they finally agreed that this agreement would not cover industrial applications if they should ever come along and be important. Well, this, this had been signed when Bohr came to England, and Chadwick hoped that Bohr would come to the United States and uh, hoped that he would participate and lend his way to the undertaking. We had talked to Chadwick in Paris then, and we understood that we had more or less the same view of would lie. And then Chadwick asked Bohr to see Sir John Anderson, who was later to become Lord Waverley. He was Secretary of the Treasury, and he was, in fact, in charge of the uranium project, the bomb project, in the United Kingdom. He was a conservative, somewhat dour, but uh, an extremely sweet man, and he was a great friend to Bohr, and they had a very quick meeting of the minds. He asked Bohr for help in maintaining and improving the position of the United Kingdom in the enterprise, and helping the enterprise as well as he could. But by then, Bohr had his first good look. It was very much like Rutherford's discovery of the nucleus 25 years before. I will be reading you short passages from things that Bohr wrote or said at the time, and you will hear what words he used and how he used them. But I think it best if I rather boldly tell you what points he had in mind at the beginning and for a long, long time. I do run the risk of oversimplifying by so doing, but I do so because it is easy, as history is well shown, for even very wise men not to know what he was talking about. This, first of all, he was clear that if it worked, this development was going to be bring an enormous change in the situation of the world, in the whole situation of war, in the tolerability of war. The word menace, the word threat, occur over and over again. When he came here, his first serious question was, is it really big enough? Well, I don't know what it was, but it did finally get to be. The second point was that he knew that the, enough of how things were in Russia, the close friends there, Kapitsa, Bukharin, Landa, any others, to be quite confident that the wartime alliance would not endure the peace things then stood. He wrote a good deal of different economic and social systems, but I think he had, had the communist world in mind rather than Africa, India. He therefore anticipated an unheard of arms race, unheard of before then, though we've lived through it and are living through it now, for these great weapons. He came to know here something about the possibility of very great increase in the power of bombs by thermonuclear reactions and referred to this very discreetly when he wrote to Roosevelt and to Anderson and to Churchill. He expected more, I think, than really has happened so far, that uh, these immense enterprises of 1943 would look a lot simpler in 53 and 63 in the way of getting the materials and assembling them. And he wanted to try to stop this arms race but to do much else besides. He was clear that one could not have an effective control of what was then, still sometimes called atomic energy, which would permit useful applications and free science and a free spirit of inquiry without a very open world. And he made this quite absolute. He thought that one would have to have privacy, 
he needed privacy. We all do. We have to make mistakes and uh, be charged with them only from time to time. He thought one would have to have respect for individual quiet and the quiet processes of government and of management. But in principle, everything that might cause, be a threat to the security of the world would have to be open to the world. And then he knew that the communists took a quite disdainful attitude towards speaking or revealing the truth. And he understood how very much this had gone beyond the tactical duplicity recommended by Lenin to the most dangerous kind of self-delusion. He didn't actually say this out in words much, and during the war he said very little about it. But when he wrote in 1948, after visiting him, uh, to General Marshall, who was then our Secretary of State, he wrote one sentence, which I'll read you. What it would mean if the whole picture of social conditions in every country were open for judgment and comparison, he'd hardly be enlarged on. Well, from all this, he understood that it wouldn't be quite in character for the Soviet Union uh, to adopt an open world. <laughs> he felt that it was essential to attempt to engage the gov that government by very early consultation, consultation in a hopeful, if cautious, spirit of friendliness with an ally that had been invaded and was occupied with a desperate defensive war, and to be willing to regard the whole enterprise as a common problem of cooperation with the Russians, the English, the Americans, what were then called the United Nations, and to be quite prepared to offer full cooperation in scientific progress and industrial exploitation, if there were any, in a world in which there were adequate safeguards, and above all, in an open world. He hoped that the situation in which the Russians would find themselves and what we would have to offer, and the opportunity for associating themselves with a great forward-looking change in the world might alter the whole character of Soviet policy and thus set a new model of international relations so that in an essential and major way, force would come, cease to play at least its decisive part and that nations would exert an influence by their example, but their persuasion, the extent to which they could truly contribute to the common welfare of all people. He was looking at one of those examples of complementarity between love and justice, of which as a youth he thought and wrote so much. Of all this he spoke while still in England to Anderson. And I saw Anderson just a few months before his death. Was, he said that he had never been reconciled to the fact that Boris's hopes and views had not been pre not prevailed, nor his counsel followed. So Bohr came to the United States late in 1943, and his cover, uh, which was even right, was that he would try to advance the cause of international scientific collaboration after the war. But, well, he, he did. And officially he came to help the technical enterprise, and the British asked him especially to strengthen their position. But most secretly of all, and with Anderson's concurrence, he came to advance his own case and cause. When he arrived in late 43, he saw the ambassador of the United Kingdom, Lord Halifax, and his own ambassador, de Kaufman, who with great bravery and gallantry represented all on his own his non-existent government and associated it with us in the conduct of the war. Through them, he met uh, Justice Frankfurter again. Uh, the justice had heard in very uh, general terms of the atomic undertaking, and he listened to Bohr with sympathy, growing and very deep respect. And then Bohr came with his son Owa, who was his companion, a friend of many of yours, his confidant, everything else, out here to Los Alamos.
I will interrupt with one very minor episode of that arrival. Uh, General Groves, whom I don't have to introduce to you, uh, brought Bore out by train. Uh, Groves thought rather more than was in fact true that Bohr might know something of what the Germans were up to. And uh, he was very eager to let to listen to Bohr and have find out all he could about it. But when they got here, uh, Grovestuck didn't come in, but he left Bohr and his son off for supper. And uh, the next morning I saw the general walking toward the laboratory, very stiff and limping. <laughs> and I asked him what, what, what disaster had befallen him. And he said, evoking an image of a compartment on the Santa Fe chief, I have been listening to Bohr. <laughs> Well, as many of you remember, he was marvelous here. He took a very lively interest. Indeed, in the last days, I learned that he once got Feynman up very early in the morning and talked with him about the technical program and said, you are too young. You will not hesitate to interrupt. You will not be too respectful of me. And then we will go and see the big shots when I know it all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he took a, 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 a real interest in whether there were any shortcuts which the Germans might be following, and uh, we worked on it a little and thought there weren't any. Uh, there was a dispute, I think some of you may remember it, about whether the initiator of the bomb would work, the implosion bomb, which was supposed not to have, give out any neutrons until the right second, and then right back a second, and then give out quite a lot. And, uh, Bohr explained that if you could keep it quiet, the implosion would fix it so that no matter how you designed it, it would work. But his real function, I think for almost all of us, was not the technical one. He made the enterprise, which was not free of misgiving. Your director for the last 19 years was not at all sure he wanted to have anything to do with this enterprise. And many others who were here were troubled about what we were up to. Well, Bohr made it seem hopeful. He spoke with contempt of Hitler, who with a few hundred tanks and planes that tried to enslave Europe for a long, long time, said nothing like that would ever happen again. And his own high hope that the outcome would be good, and that in this, the role of the objectivity, the cooperation which he'd experienced among scientists, uh, the reasonableness that this would play a helpful part. All this, all of us wanted very, very much to believe. Early in 44, just as Frankfurt had talked to Roosevelt about Bohr's ideas, and the president listened with great interest and with a word of encouragement, which he asked Bohr to take back to England. At that same time, Anderson had been talking to the Prime Minister, trying to see whether he wouldn't open up the subject a little within the British government so that they might look at what to do, think about a little bit about the future. Well, this didn't too much appeal to Churchill. So Ball went back over in April, in 44, with a word for Anderson of Roosevelt's interest. Uh, one episode occurred then, uh, the first secretary of the Soviet embassy had a letter for Bohr from Kapitza, who had been in Cambridge and was well loved by Rutherford, well known to Bohr, and then kept by the Russians from leaving because they said he was needed at home. This was in the 30s. And Kapitza wrote, asking Bohr, of whose escape to Sweden he had heard, to come to Russia, saying things had really been pretty awful, but now they could work and Bohr would be very much at home and among colleagues. And Bohr concluded, I don't know whether rightly or not, that the Russians were interested in practical nuclear problems. And his answer was very friendly and hopeful, um, and he said he had other plans to arrange for international cooperation when the war was won. <laughs> Bohr saw Anderson again, and Dale, the president of the Royal Society, and Charles, who was Churchill's personal scientific advisor, 
and a Churchill suggestion. They all talked to Smoot, who was rightly regarded as one of the wise men of the world. But the four of them came to no more startling conclusion that, than that uh, when Churchill and Roosevelt ne next met, they had better talk a little bit about things. Hmm. Then finally, Bohr did meet with Churchill and Charwell, and it was a very unhappy occasion. I don't think Charwell thought very highly of Bohr. Uh, anyway, he didn't do anything to prepare the prime minister for the fact that a rather great man was coming, and Churchill and Charwell felt of bickering about something, and Bohr couldn't talk, and uh, he didn't ever like that very much, and on an occasion like this, he liked it very little. Then he wrote a letter to Churchill, trying to explain what he would have said if he'd had a chance, and saying again that uh, he really had come with a message from the President of the United States. Well, Bohr came back here, that is, to Los Alamos, and then late in August, after he had prepared a memorandum which Frankfurter showed to the President, he met the President, and they had a long, long talk. I know that afterwards Bohr was very much encouraged. Bohr never quoted, he was correct and experienced, he never quoted anyone except himself. Um, but I'd like to read you what he wrote for Roosevelt, and you'll see in what terms he put these things, and so correct for the grossness of my my own transcription. Indeed, it would appear that only when the question is taken up among the United Nations of what concessions the various powers are prepared to make is their contribution to an adequate control arrangement, it will be possible for any one of the partners to assure themselves of the sincerity of the intention of the others. Of course, the responsible statesman alone can have the insight in the actual political possibilities. It would, however, seem most fortunate that the expectations for a future harmonious international cooperation, which have found unanimous expression from all sides within the United Nations, so remarkably correspond to the unique opportunities which are known to the public have been created by the advancement of science. Many reasons, indeed, would seem to justify the conviction that an approach with the object of establishing common security from ominous menaces, without excluding any nation from participating in the promising industrial development, will be responded to by a loyal cooperation on the enforcement of the necessary far-reaching control measures and will be welcomed. Then Bohr, after his visit to Ro with Roosevelt, in a supplementary note, which could have had unhappy consequences, pointed out, among other things, how close the relations between members of the scientific community had been, and saying that also though statesmen must decide and act, perhaps scientists who had known and trusted one another could help to prepare the ground. Then in September, Churchill came over, and he and Roosevelt met at Quebec. They seemed to have saved discussion of atomic problems until they met at Hyde Park. Of this discussion, there's an Ed memoir initialed by both men. They reached three conclusions. They were based apparently on a substantial, if not a total misunderstanding of what Bohr was after. For the first conclusion was that Bohr's suggestion that the world be told about the development be rejected. Well, that was not what Bohr was about. He didn't want to tell the world about anything. He thought it important for someone bearing Roosevelt's authority to talk to Stalin, or if there were anyone, someone bearing Stalin's authority, about the problems of the future, about the need for a shared responsibility, and about the need for an open world. And only if there could be a meeting of the minds on that, and some working out of how it would work, and there was, in fact, such a thing as an atomic bomb, which there wasn't yet, or maybe wasn't, never. Then one might think of explaining what had happened and what might come of it. But Roosevelt and Churchill harshly rejected this approach, 
and said the highest secrecy, not this approach, but what they misunderstood of it, and said the highest secrecy should be maintained. Well, that was certainly being tried. Um, it was, to some extent, successful. They said in the second place that when the bombs were ready, then after mature deliberation, they might be used in the war against Japan. And they said third, that they would like a very careful watch put on board. They had come not to trust him. This was indeed rather, rather a grave development. Uh, for one thing, it shows that really very great men dealing with a pretty great man can be very wrong. It worked itself out before long. The British were absolutely sure that Bohr was one of the noblest men of our time. Bush and many of his associates were, and were sure that this was all nonsense. But Bohr, although no one suspected him anymore, uh, really could no longer communicate. Uh, it stopped entirely his communication with the president, <coughs> and it seriously clouded and impeded his communication with our government. He wanted to talk to Colonel Stimson, the Secretary of War, he never got to. In March of 45, many months later, Bohr wrote another memorandum. By then, the dates for the coming of the bombs, which were at last, I think, almost entirely determined by the production schedules, were, were pretty well known. The United Nations were about to have their first meeting in San Francisco. And Bohr had a great sense of urgency that the question of the atom not be let go too long. I shall read you one more passage, which is the end of that memorandum of March 45. It's a little long, but it's worth listening to. <coughs> As argued in the memorandum, that's the one from which I quoted, it would seem most fortunate that the measures demanded for coping with a new situation brought about by the advance of science and confronting mankind at a crucial moment of world affairs fit in so well with the expectation for a future intimate international cooperation which have found unanimous expression from all sides within the nations united against aggression. Moreover, the very novelty of the situation should offer a unique opportunity of appealing to an unprejudiced attitude and it would even appear that an understanding about this vital matter might contribute most favorably toward the settlement of other problems where history and traditions have fostered divergent viewpoints. With regard to such wider prospects, it would in particular seem that the free access to information necessary for common security should have far-reaching effects in removing obstacles barring mutual knowledge about the spiritual and material aspects of life in the various countries without which respect and goodwill between nations can hardly endure. Participation in the development, largely initiated by international scientific collaboration and involving immense potentialities as regarding human welfare, would also reinforce the intimate bonds which were created in the years before the war between scientists of different nations. In the present situation, <coughs> these bonds may prove especially helpful in connection with the deliberations of the respective governments and the establishment of the control. I skip three, two paragraphs. All such opportunities may, however, be forfeited if an initiative is not taken while the matter can be raised in the spirit of friendly advice. In fact, a postponement to await further developments might, especially if preparations for competitive efforts in the meantime have reached an advanced stage, give the approach, the appearance of an attempted coercion in which no great nation can be expected to acquiesce. Indeed, it need hardly be stressed how fortunate in every respect it would be if at the same time as the world will know of the formidable destructive power which has come into human hands, it could be told that the great scientific and technical advance has been helpful in creating a solid foundation for a future peaceful cooperation between nations. <coughs>
I don't know whether Roosevelt ever read that memorandum. He died very shortly thereafter. As he died, when he died, he was writing a speech, since published but never delivered, on the new powers of science and war and the need for men to live in peace with one another. Indeed, he said, the new science of human relations. The very hour that Roosevelt died, Lord Halifax and Justice Frankfurter were walking in Lafayette Park, just outside the White House, talking of the bomb and of Boer's hopes. With Roosevelt's death, Boer's memoranda were given by Bush to Stimson, the Secretary of War. Shortly thereafter, he appointed a committee in which Carl Compton and Bush and Conant were the technical members in which State, War, and Navy, the Office of the President, were represented. It was called the Interim Committee, was supposed to think about things. In the sense, of course, Boer was not a, alone at all. Bush and Compton and Conant were clear that the only future they could envisage with hope was one in which this whole development would be internationally controlled. Stimson understood this. He understood it meant a very great change in human life, and he understood that the central problem at that moment lay in our relations with Russia. The authors of the Frank Report in Chicago, the metallurgical lab, were clear that this was the course of hope, and so wrote. And so were the scientists who banded together after the war and came to form the Federation of American Scientists. And so were countless others, many of those to whom I'm talking, many throughout the country. But there were differences. Ball was for action and for timely and responsible action. He had he realized that it had to be in the hands of those who had power to commit an act. He wanted to change the whole framework within this problem would appear early enough so that the problem would be altered by it. He believed in statesmen. He used the word over and over again. He was not very much for committees. The interim committee was a committee and proved itself by appointing another committee. <laughs> The scientific panel of which Arthur Compton, Fermi, Lawrence, and I were members. We met with the, the interim committee on the 31st of May, and we talked just about the question of relations with Russia, secrecy, openness, future of science, the future of atomic enterprises. Some people remember talking about the use of the bomb, and that no doubt occurred, but not in committee session. I was very deeply impressed with General Marshall's wisdom and also with Secretary Stimson. And then I went over to the British mission and met Bohr and tried to comfort him, but uh, he was too, too wise and too worldly to be comforted. And he left for England very soon after that, quite uncertain. But what, if anything, would happen? In June, the scientific panel uh, was out here, and we were asked another question by the interim committee. But we answered when we weren't asked. <laughs> we recommended that before a firm decision on the use of the bomb, our government talk of the future to our allies. And the interim committee met on the 21st of June and uh, agreed that this was the right thing to do and agreed that it should be undertaken at the meeting at Potsdam between the President, the Prime Minister, and uh, I guess many things, Generalissimo Stalin, which was planned for July 16th. But as you probably know, we thought we had to make a test. We did have to make a test on technical grounds, and we hoped to get it done by the 16th of July. So President and the Secretary of War might have some notion of whether it, it worked at all. Hmm. It did, but there wasn't any talk with the Russians. Some of you may have read the history of it, the history of Potsdam and of the decision to use the bombs uh, is probably best found in two books of Feist, uh, one called Churchill, Roosevelt, Stalin, and one called uh, Japan Subdued. 
which have certainly taken advantage of every scrap of paper in the American archive. There isn't very much that bears on either question. <coughs> well, then, the, wor the bomb worked, and some of you may know how it went from this or other sources. Stimson himself wrote that he was horrified when he saw what sort of thing the Red Army was, and as he says, he rather lost his nerve. Burns had been rather against talking to the Russians, and Churchill wasn't against talking them to them, but he was against saying anything. <laughs> but they all agreed that if the president said something to Stalin and used the Trinity explosion as the occasion, it would at least relieve us of the, of the risk reproaches of double dealing. So when the news came in from New Mexico, uh, very much more alert then than it would right now, the president dismissed his interpreter, who was Charles Bolin, in order to keep things casual, and went over to Stalin. Now, Stalin didn't have his interpreter, Pavlov, but another man whose name is not known. And Truman's remark that we had a new weapon, which was quite powerful, and which we were thinking of using against Japan, according to Truman, and he is obviously the only witness, uh, Stalin said he wished us luck and hoped it would work. It seems to me that that was carrying casualness rather far. <laughs> With the use of the bombs, which raised other, and of course not entirely separate, but I think rather separate questions, there came some pronouncements about international control. In late 45, uh, the Prime Minister of England and Mackenzie King of Canada came over and we all agreed to seek some action looking toward international control of atomic energy. The debate on legislation in this country was then in full course and Secretary Burns undertook to bring the matter up with the Russians when he visited Moscow. He had in mind asking them whether they would approve the creation of a commission in the United Nations to talk about this subject. He was uh, rather touchingly afraid that they would ask him how to make a bomb. He, he didn't know, but he was afraid of it anyway. <laughs> but they were much less eager to talk about it than he was, and nothing much was said except that all agreed to make a commission. Well, Vandenberg, Senator Vandenberg and Senator Connolly said they heard this word safeguards. What did that mean? So Secretary Burns appointed a committee of five under the chairmanship of the undersecretary, Mr. Atchison, to devise controls. And that was a committee, too, because a few days later it made another committee. And the undersecretary appointed a panel under the chairmanship of Lilienthal to devise what was supposed to be controlled. We sat at this for longer than we should, for two months, respecting each other and the problem, thinking of what things needed really to be worried about, what could and should be left free, and how they should be related to one another, and what kind of a world this would be, how one could have international developments and international research, how one could make sure without uh, over-policing uh, that things were open and above board. And uh, as a committee document and for the times, it was, I think, really not too bad. Bohr was not too not happy with it. Uh, for one thing, he, he was not satisfied because we didn't center it squarely enough on the fact that there must not be secrets of any kind. We said that, but that wasn't the only thing we said. Actually, when uh, this proposal and was brought by Ambassador de Bruch to the United Nations, the military staff members, the United States military staff members, said that if this ever got off the ground, there wouldn't be any secrets, because you couldn't have any secrets if you opened up the field of atomic energy, and Bohr would have had his openness. But Bohr was right, because of course it didn't get off the ground, nothing happened, and to that Bohr said, and these are the only words of reproach he ever spoke to me, this situation, this time, calls for action. It was an action to make the bomb. Bohr did not quite abandon hope, although it was clear that the, what he had been working for, uh, 
we try to persuade the Russians ab initio to, to be our collaborators, allies, and guarantors of the peace, that there wasn't much left to that. But he still felt that it was a great cause to do away with barriers to information, a great cause to model the state of the world, whether it had to do with technical things or economic or political or cultural, on the old world of science, the world in which we all tried to tell each other what we had done, what we had found, and to compete, but not to kill each other. He talked in 46 to the acting Secretary of State, and then in 48, in part through McCloy, uh, he had a long, thoughtful, grave interview with General Marshall. The Secretary of State was going to Paris to take part in the general debate, I think it's called, at the United Nations Assembly there, and to explain the American position. Bohr hoped that Marshall would say, we are prepared, we are for doing away with secrets and with proper, in a proper situation, with proper safeguards and controls, and in an open world, we are fully prepared to do it. The Secretary didn't say that. He thought, he told me, of saying it, but he didn't. By 1950, after the first Soviet explosion and uh, the decision to try to make that thermonuclear bombs and uh, in a situation in which it was clear to everyone that we had to worry about our armaments generally, just before the Korean War, Paul wrote an open letter to the United Nations he gave a very discreet account of history, above all what he thought and what he'd said. I will read you, and it's the last thing I will, just a few lines from the end of that letter. It's quite different. He's not talking to presidents and prime ministers. He's talking to you, to me. The efforts of all supporters of international cooperation, individual as well as nations, will be needed to create in all countries an opinion to voice with ever increasing clarity and strength the demand for an open world. Now I cannot tell, and I suspect that others could tell better, but still not tell, whether early actions along the lines suggested by Bohr would have changed the course of history. There's nothing I know, nothing I've read, of Stalin and his behavior that gives one any shred of hope on that score. But Bohr understood this action that he advocated was to change, create a great change in the situation. He didn't say this officially, but he said one in, once in jest, thinking of the quantum theory, another experimental arrangement. I think myself that if we had acted wisely and clearly and discreetly, more or less in accordance with his views, at the least we might have been freed of our rather blasphemous sense of omnipotence and our delusions about the effectiveness of secrecy, and might have turned our society and our life toward a healthier vision of a future worth living for and an increased dedication to knowledge and to truth. With the development of the arms race, its intensification, the bitterness of the Cold War, the multi-megaton warheads and the rockets, Bohr concentrated more and more on what he knew he could do, on international cooperation in science, on good communication, on proper institutions, on goodwill. He talked of his old interests with anyone who cared to listen his own institute of theoretical physics, a little Scandinavian institute called Nordita, both housed in the same building in Copenhagen, were early examples. He spoke at the first Atoms for Peace conference, which of course in the whole field of science was a very modest thing, but did really mark the beginning of the erosion of very formidable barriers to communication. He took pride in the fact that at the second Atoms for Peace conference, the only Danish contribution was a joint paper 
by a Russian and an American. He played a most helpful part not only in establishing the great European Nuclear Research Center, CERN, near Geneva, but in protecting it from the provincialism of the Six and of Europe and of the military preoccupation that characterizes NATO. He went to Russia, thought of traveling there many times to bring some word of interest and hope from the governments of the United States, but he went there not long before his death just to visit and talk with Khrushchev. He traveled extensively in this country, in England, in Israel, in India, long, tiring trip. In October of 61, he spoke retrospectively at the 50th anniversary of the Salve Congress about the development of atomic physics. And in June of 62, at Lindau with other Nobel laureates, he had a light stroke. He appeared to be recovering, and in October, he started recording the first five interviews of what were to be the history of quantum physics, so certainly in part anyway, a history of a poor. On the 18th of November, he died, in retrospect, incomplete. Bohr often spoke with deep appreciation of mortality, mortality that screens out the mistakes and the failures and the follies that would otherwise encumber our future and that makes it possible that what we've learned and what has proved itself be transmitted for the next generations. On November 18th, as Bohr died, his son Oro was returning with his wife from a month in China where he lectured on nuclear structure. It was much earlier, in late September 1945, that Colonel Stimson left Washington for good. He was no longer young and he was no longer very well. On that day, he had a cabinet meeting coming up where he would once again, in final and eloquent terms, advocate, though now very belatedly, an open, friendly approach to Russia on the problems of the atom. Later in the day, he would take off, and General Marshall was to have every general officer in Washington out on the runway to salute him and say goodbye to their chief. Well, for all this, Colonel Stimson had to have his hair trimmed, and he asked me to sit with him when he was in the barber's chair. When it was time to go, he said, now it is in your hands. Boy never said anything like that to anybody. He did not need to. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.